Hallelujah. This morning, I'd like to share a message to the people of God called if. Isn't that an interesting word, if? As you get older, you have a lot of ifs. If I would have done this, if I would have taken that job, if I would have moved here, if I would have married this person, all these ifs. If my people, if my people. Did you know from your Bible that the future of America is not in the hands of politicians? It's in the hands of Christians, Christian believers. Yes, there's evil, there's wickedness, there's unrighteousness, there's all kinds of things that are happening around us, a culture of chaos. Why is all this happening? The politicians, the people, the social scientists have told us our society is in chaos. They don't have answers. Right is wrong and wrong is right. Our text this morning is found in the book of Romans in the first chapter. As you find it in your Bible, would you stand as we honor the word of God? Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. This is a great chapter to read. Read the whole chapter because God is telling us that no matter who the person is, one day they'll stand before him and there'll be no excuses for why people didn't come to Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men and women who hold the truth in unrighteousness. That's what's happening today. Wicked behavior is considered normal because that, is, that which may be known of God is manifest in them. You know that God has planted a seed of faith in every person? Oh, hallelujah. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so they, that they are without excuse. Lord, bless the reading of his word. and Bless his servant as he brings it forth. Hallelujah. I was watching a Christian TV program last night, and in it, this brother was trying to show us how God has given us the cure for everything, the very things that we eat, and it was amazing. A carrot, if you cut it, looks like an eye, an eyeball, and it's good for your eyes. And kidney beans, good for the kidney, and so on. He went through all these fruits and vegetables that are in the shape of our body organs that are good for them. God is right there, right in front of us, to help us be healthy, even in the physical. But it says here very clearly that God is clearly manifest in people. Recently, they found something called lumens, not the ones from the light, but something that holds all the cells in our body together. Because if they weren't there, we'd just fall apart. And when they found them, and they gave us pictures of them, how many have seen them? They're in the shape of a cross. Isn't that a coincidence? The Bible says, in Christ, behold, all things were created and consist. They hold together because of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. God's Proof of who he is is everywhere, everywhere, and people still don't see him. See, God is telling us here in Romans that our nation, our great nation, that the cause of all our problems is spiritual. It's a spiritual foundation that we have caused to, to be destroyed. You see, if America, if Staten Island is to be saved from God's anger, if it's to change, it'll be because real Christians will fall on their knees and faces and pray to God real prayers, effectual, fervent prayers. We're going to see that the key to all the mess around us is not the world, it's us, those that believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You see, the, the answer is found in 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter and the 14th verse, God's prescription for individuals and nations. We read King Solomon, the wisest man ever born. He just becomes king, and 
he completed the temple. And he dedicates this temple in Jerusalem and addresses the people of God. And it's interesting because the people of God, the Israelites, were disobedient, disrespected God, and had forgotten him. And they were following after their own lusts. And Solomon didn't know what to do. And he prayed. And God spoke to him in the night. Listen to the words. We see them in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 11. God says, I have heard your prayer. Wow. And have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. If I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people, my people, who are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. This is God's prescription for nations, for cities, for the world, and for believers. God was telling Solomon that if people turn away from him and reject God's way, then human solutions will not save them from destruction. This is not a human battle we're following. The fighting is a spiritual battle. America is running for help to all the wrong people. I listen sometimes on, on the news, and this guy says this, and this woman says that, and none of them have the solution. Only God can solve our problems. In God we trust that's almost a joke. Notice God's warning is not addressed to the king or to the president. It's addressed to God's people, you and I. My people who are called by my name. It's amazing how the Supreme Court and the Congress of the United States start with a prayer, a generic prayer, and yet nothing happens. Nothing happens. Just a ritual. The Old and New Testament, we're studying the Old Testament especially, show where God has a covenant with his people. God has no covenant with sinners. Did you know that? Other, when, when they're asking for salvation, when they're asking to be forgiven. Only God's people can intercede to God for America. That's what God is saying. They bear his name. They are under his authority and under his protection. God is saying, you belong to me. I love you. I want to bless you. Satan knows this. That's why he doesn't want Christians to get together and pray. We're not just talking about one church or one town or one city. Imagine if all the believers in this country who believe in Christ as Lord and Savior would be one. In unity. Hallelujah. The devil knows if this happens, he has to leave town. Our own Staten Island here. Less than 2% of the people here can say they're born again Christians. We lead the city in suicides, prescription drug abuse. Abortions. What happened? We're known as a religious borough. But religion doesn't do it. It has to be a relationship with God. The next phrase of God's warning is, they shall humble themselves and pray. Humility is strength under control. It's recognizing that arrogance and pride and haughtiness doesn't impress God. It doesn't. In the Old Testament, the saints experienced humility. They put on sackcloth and ashes when they were grieving over something. And they went on their faces before God. Humil humility is the essence of an attitude in prayer. Because it's an admission to God, I can't do this. That's hard for Americans to say. I can't do it. Hmm? Especially men. He can do it. A lot of people never get past that because the last part of it is 
I am going to let him do it his way, in his time, and in his purpose, in his will. Humility says to God, I need you. We used to sing an old hymn, I need thee every hour. Every hour I need thee. There's no time during the day when we don't need God. Just like the people that were in those buildings up in Harlem. They weren't planning on dying. They were planning on a day like any other. And boom, everything changed. Isn't it amazing that we, even the believers, try everyone and everything before we go to God and pray? We put prayer last. And when you do that, you're putting God last. Oh, people can give us good advice, but it may not be what God wants us to do or hear. Hmm? When God is last, everyone and everything else is a waste of time. King David messed up many times. But you know what was great about him? He constantly inquired of the Lord. Come to Bible study, you'll see it. Should I go out to battle today? Should I do this? Should I do that? You ever ask God in the morning before you go out the door what to do? Or should you make a decision on something? Ever ask him? You have that privilege and that right. You see, in seeking God's face, which is the next thing it says, to come to him humbly and seek his face. Some of you understand that more than others. It means the intensity of our prayers. In America, we have this thing about when you're talking to someone, you look in their face to find out if they hear what you're saying and agree or disagree with you. Some of you come from countries like Nigeria, which have great respect for elders, and they won't even look at them in the face. They'll look down, they'll look to the side. When I first encountered it, I had a problem with it. I said, Don't you, aren't you listening? They were being respectful, but I thought it was disrespect. How about those of us that grow up with a mother that gave you the look? Some of you young people don't know about the look. That meant you were in trouble. And that look would make you uncomfortable for a long time. That was part of it. And then the punishment came. But seeking the face of God is different. Seeking his face means seeking his approval is what we want. We have to learn to submit to his terms, his way, his timing, his will. Some of you are praying for a prodigal son or daughter. Have you ever said to God, God, I release this young man, this young woman to you. Do what you have to do to him or her. Protect them, but Bring them to the cross. The prodigal son, the story that Jesus gave, the parable, was interesting because the father never went after him. And you know why? Because he could have dragged him back home, and guess what happens? He's going to run out again. It was only till he realized that he was in trouble that he could get help. Really realized it. You see, God is always ready and waiting for the people, his people, to seek his face. Hmm? Notice in 2 Chronicles, it also tells us, seek his face. It's linked together with turn from your wicked ways. Isn't that interesting? Because when you look into the face of God, just that look reveals to you what you're doing wrong. That's why we don't want to do it. We think we're wonderful people. People tell us how wonderful we are, right? We're really not. We're just sinners saved by grace each day working out our salvation. When we seek his face, we see ourselves the way God sees us. And right away we know we have to make some changes. Hmm? See, if we're living by our own rules, and a lot of people are, even Christians, nothing will change. Prayer is a waste of time and meaningless then. Real prayer must be followed by a decision of our will to do a 180-degree turn sometimes 
to an about face toward God, toward him in anything or anyone, to be in his will. Again, we used to sing songs like, I surrender all. I surrender all. What a powerful statement to God. God, I give up. Do what you have to do. Because I want to be in your presence forever. And whatever it takes, I'm willing to accept it. Hmm? You see, it's either God's way or no way. It's as simple as that. Our society is falling apart. God says, because believers... Refuse to forsake their wicked ways. Believers are wicked? Read the book of 1 Corinthians and see what Paul talks about this wonderful, powerful, Holy Spirit filled church. <coughs> he mentions all of their past in general. They were thieves and robbers, they were hustlers, they were homosexuals. What a group of people in a church. He goes through a whole list. And then he says, as such as you were, past tense. When he starts 2 Corinthians, he lists another group of things that the church was doing. Gossiping, backbiting, unforgiveness. Wow! They traded their worldly sins for church sins. Be careful. Sin is sin, no matter how you code it, right? Right? See, if we turn away from God, we're going in a different direction, away from him. Again, it's either God's way or no way. Hallelujah. God does not negotiate concerning his standards and his word. Hmm? Can I get a get-out-of-jail-free card from God? No. No. It's his way. We have to place ourselves under God's authority. Yes, sir. Hmm? Our opinions, our thoughts on a given subject are not going to change God's mind. Hmm? You can't expect God's blessings if you're disobedient to his word. It's simple as that. We as believers are doing what Israel of the Old Testament did. Not just this church, the whole church of Jesus Christ. We worship other gods. Pastor. I don't have any idols in my house. No, your house is an idol. Oh, I've been in people's houses. You had to take your shoes off, and I'm not saying again, because some cultures you have to do that. But the house was a museum. One lady had white rugs. Don't touch anything, right? <laughs> then they lived in the basement, so they didn't mess up the house. So what good is having the house if you live in the basement? But we worship things. Cars. Oh, don't mess with my car. We're out there every day wiping our car down, waxing it up. I'm not against that. Compare the amount of time you work on that to the amount of time you're in God's presence. I know what you're thinking. Oh, I pray while I'm doing it. <laughs> How about toys? Oh, we love our toys. Men and women, young and old. Now the toys are electronic. Wow. Even in church, people are playing with their electronic toys. Hmm? <laughs> By the way, you can't text God. Hmm? How about money? We talked about that. How much is enough for you? Hmm? Fame. You know, really, toys are us. How many toys do you have? That's who we are. The bad news is we can't take them with us. And wor worse than that is, God's going to destroy it all anyway. Make a new heavens and a new earth. You see, we have had a problem in Christianity. We have conformed to the world. The word conform in the Bible means to imitate. Hmm? I see churches and advertising for hip-hop and, and bashing and smashing kind of things to bring young people in. What happened to the Holy Spirit? Huh? 
Young people have a lot of problems today. What about the Holy Spirit and praying for them and reaching out to them? Look what Romans 12, 2 says. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that she may what? May prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God is saying, you're called by my name. I am your father. I know what's best for you. I died on a cross for you. I defeated death for you. What has the world done for you that is eternal and forever? Nothing. We can't get to God without asking his forgiveness and forgiving others. A lot of people get hung up on that. But I'm going to tell you something I've learned. If you can't forgive somebody, God will not forgive you. It's in the book. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It doesn't mean they're off the hook with God. It just means you don't have to carry that baggage anymore. No one gets away with sin. Someone has to pay. God offers forgiveness to all, and he paid for it. Hmm? And it's not a one-time payment, is it? Yes, he went to the cross once for all. But every day, we continue to sin. If not an action, in our mind. Look at the scripture in 1 John 1 and 9. If, if, notice that word again. If we confess, God is reactive. He's not proactive. He reacts to our actions. You have to start it. If we confess our sins, that means to tell the truth about ourselves. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice something my English professors here. It's in the present tense, not in the past, not in the future, but in the present. Because as we walk through the day, as we drive through the day, we sin. I'll say amen for you. I've met a few Christians that said they don't sin. When somebody tells you that, just back away from them because the lightning is going to hit. In fact, read a couple of verses down. It says, if we say we have no sin, we have deceived ourselves. Oh, hallelujah. And it says, from all unrighteousness, meaning the desire to sin again, he takes away from us. So why do we do it again? Because we pick it up and put it back in our pocket, so to speak. Once God's people, you and I, confess our sins to him, he forgives us and cleanses us, and he tells us in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that he will hear from heaven and heal our land. The effect here is very powerful. God will heal us and our land. Our land includes not just the United States of America, It's our families, our courts, our schools, our colleges, our churches. Everything that we live in or with is our land. This was the prescription for healing in Israel. Even other nations would be blessed by them if they honored and obeyed God. I really don't know what nations we're blessing today. Except the ones we're shooting at. And this is the prescription for us today. It hasn't changed. Do you realize that even the Gentiles that lived in the old Israel were blessed because of the obedience of God's people? Where you work, where you go to school, should be blessed because you're there. That's in the Bible. God will bless our hands, our jobs, our workplaces, our schools, if we are doing what we should for the Lord. I'll even add your business. Go into business with God and watch what happens. Our problem today is God's people in the church of today has lost God's blessings. Hmm? Our pride and our desire to be accepted by everybody causes us to turn away from God's blessings to worldly blessings. We have a bad habit of measuring our Christianity by everything we own. Guess what? You don't own it. 
I haven't anybody seen there taking a house or a car with them in the grave. Or even their bank account. Hmm? God's people can be a force for spiritual and natural and financial and emotional blessing in our country and in our world. If we would just be Christians. Not just with our mouth. Some of us don't even say that. Last week we spoke about the truth. Does the world see the truth in us? Believers, whoever and wherever they are in society, can challenge the system that is destroying all of America, not by picketing, by simply using God's advice, starting with ourselves. If we get straight with God everywhere we go, we can help straighten out. Oh, hallelujah. God desires a commitment to him. He'll change our families. He'll change our communities. He'll change our cities, our states, and even our nation. Knowing that, why don't we pray like God tells us to do? I don't have time, Pastor. I'm so busy. <laughs> How much time do you spend on TV? Does that do any blessing for you? How about the cable, the internet, the Facebook, all these little games that we play? Are they doing anything for you spiritually? Hmm? Oh, yes, they have their use. But no time to pray. How about family? We have to work two or three jobs so our family will be better off and have everything. Is everything good for a family? I don't think it is. Some of you young people don't know what it is to work at 12 or 10 or 11 or 14 years old. Everything's been given to you, and you don't know what it means for earn a, a dollar. You've learned nothing about people in the workplace. Isn't it best to have less and have peace in your family? Be there for them. We're going to talk about that on Father's Day. How about the church? We don't even have time for church. This place should be packed. Sunday's a day for sports. Oh, yes. Quality time with the family. Shopping and fixing cars and cleaning the attic or the basement and so on and so on and so on. It's one of the Ten Commandments to honor God. We don't have time for that. But when something goes wrong, God help me. If I was God, I'd say, who are you? I haven't seen you in such a long time. Heard from you. How about money? We need more money, don't we? We talked about this last week. We're printing money like crazy. And it's not, bad, not backed up by anything. How much money is enough? Hmm? How many toys and things do you have to have so you can be happy? Hmm? I watch kids today. You give them a toy, you pay $50, 60 $100 for it. Ten minutes later... They're playing with the box. How about our heroes? Who do we look up to? Sports figures? Almost every day, one of them's in trouble somewhere. Music figures? Political figures? Every one of these people fail us. I'll even add religious figures. America's falling apart from within. Just like Khrushchev said years ago, we don't have to fight these people. They'll destroy themselves. He was right. Our enemy is not another country. It's us. We were founded by God's blessings. But we've stepped on them. We disrespect God. We kick him out of public places. His name is offensive. The name of God is offensive. We want to be politically correct in a society torn apart by differences. We live in a city where you couldn't get everybody in the city to all agree on one thing. The diversity is, is a blessing and a curse at the same time. Yet we want blessings from God. God is saying loud and clear to his people, I will forgive you. I will heal you. I'll make you great among the nations. And among the people that you're with. If my people, called by my name, will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. First thing we want to do is say, look what that guy's doing, right? That's like when your kids come home with a bad mark on a test. You say, what happened? Oh, I got a 30, but John got a 10. Hmm? When we turn from our wicked ways, it says, then and only then, I've added, will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You see, only believing, humble, forgiven Christians can get through to heaven. When it comes to intercession, only God's sons and daughters can access the throne of grace and love and power. But it's just like when we go into a place and we want to make an impression, we have to go in clean, right? Only God's people can bear his name. Only God's people can have his Holy Spirit presence dwell in them. We have a wonderful, great God who is willing to forgive us and heal us and, and heal our nation if us, his people, are willing to fall on their faces and seek his face. It's so easy to blame the world. Look what they're doing. Look how messed they are messed up. God's not asking us to change them. He'll do that. He's asking us to change ourselves first. And we don't have to be the majority. We are the boundary keepers for God. We're the people that will show how this nation can be blessed. 